So the text I'm going to use this morning is John 13, 34 and 35. And as you're finding this in your Bibles, I want you to, to know this is right before the Passover. This is when Christ's time is what they call has come in his final hours. It's when he is going to, uh, he's going to wash the disciples' feet. He's going to give a hint as to whom has betrayed him. He is going to, uh, this is it. This is, he's going to show how much he cares. But before he does, he's going to give us a tidbit of information. Okay? Something that we could carry. He's going to give us a final command. Okay? And that verse 34 says, A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Meaning the way that I've loved you, that's how you're supposed to love. Not the way that we were taught to love as we are grown and when we're child, to, to love our ponies, to love our our brothers and sisters, but the way God loves us, all of us, the good and the bad. Amen. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have loved one another. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come today just to get a fraction of your word, just to get a little bit of fill up for us, Lord, to to redeem us again, to let us understand what your word means to us. And Father, Lord, we're going to try our best to get through these scriptures. And in these scriptures, there's going to be a message for each and every one of us. Father, it may not be the same, Father, that every one of us receive it the same way, Father, Lord. But I pray that we don't hear just the words that we're going to say. We won't hide it and keep it in our heart, Father. Lord, we'll disseminate this information that we've got from your holy inspired word, Father, Lord. And that we can give it to ourselves. We can give it to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And better yet, spread it throughout this community that we live in, Father, Lord. You created this world. You love this world. If you hadn't, you wouldn't have put us in this world, Father, Lord. And we're here to make a new creation in an old world, Father, Lord. To spread a new word into this old earth. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We magnify your name. In Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. Amen. So in the Bible, it tells us a description of what love is. I won't ask you to turn there unless you want to. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Amen. And I'm just going to tell you right now, there's a couple of chapter 13s that I'm going to be going and reiterating it. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not, uh, I found it intriguing to me that a lot of love things are in a chapter 13. I don't know why. Everybody considers that bad luck. I don't know. I've been pretty lucky in love. Chapter <coughs> 13. Amen. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, if you will. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about love. And if I, if I say green in here, excuse me, because I'm trying to follow my notes. And because I've highlighted them in green, so if I say green by accident, you know what I'm talking about. I am preaching out of the word, the New King James Version. That's on my device here. So we say, what is love? Paul describes love as this. Love suffers long and it is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things hopes all things, endures all things, and love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether this is knowledge, it will vanish away. Amen. So Paul gave us a whole mouthful of things to know, right? He's like, man, that was a, that's a whole lot of love. It's almost easier to know what love is not than what love is. Amen. And it's not, everything is important in there. You know, it's not just things that maybe we can pick out and use. Okay, that applies to me, but that really doesn't apply to me. I think I can be rude sometimes. Right, because I'm just trying to make a point. I'm trying to, I, you know, I'm a leader and I need to get things settled down. Hey, hey, hey. You know, that's not, God didn't do that. Amen. When he was preaching the parables, when he was in the Sermon on the Mount, he, he in my scriptures don't say where he, he, he tries to get people's attention. He started speaking and they just listened. 
Amen. That's love and respect. Amen. How many of us have been envious? I've been envious. Like, I'll tell you something. I was going through Nashville one time, and I had my son with me, my, my youngest boy with me, and I was going to the VA. And it's right as uh, right as uh, 24 was coming into 40. And uh, this yellow Lamborghini passed me like I was parked on the road. Okay? And uh, I was envious. I was like, man, I want to get into that thing. I want to ride in it. I want those doors to open. Better yet, maybe I want people to see me get out of it. Right? right? So, now, that's a couple things that love is not. It's not puffed up, because I would have absolutely been puffed up if Big Dog stepped out of that car. Amen? Like, you know it's true, don't you? Are y'all here this morning? I mean, come on. We're speaking real things that happen in this world. This is what the Bible is trying to tell us what love is not. So we know when we do those things, it's a reiteration of, oh, okay, it's not envious, it's not puffed up. But what is love? That's a great question. What is love? Uh, how do we know love? If you look in 1 John 4, 1 John 4, 7 through 11. 1 John 4, 7 to 11. Every time I, I use the device, it fails me. Amen? Has anybody been there? I, I'm a little envious of people who can work electronics. Right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's okay. First John, right after Peter. All right, First John, four through seven. I don't have it marked green in here, so bear with me. <laughs> How do we know love? This is the only way that love is known. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who, who is born of God knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into this world, that we might live through Him in His love, not as we love God, but that He loved us and sent His only begotten Son. His son, <clears throat> the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. So this is telling me that uh, <clears throat> the only way that we can have love in our lives is if we have God in our hearts, correct? Because if God is love and we don't have God in our hearts, then we have no love. Amen. And this is, in, <clears throat> we try to apply this in everything that we talk about and everything that we do. I know it is very, very difficult to always show love sometimes, especially in moments of uh, anxiety and in moments of uh, uh, just, you remember I told you, well, like, what is the first thought that you think when you smash your thumbnail uh, with a hammer? <laughs> Is it love? <clears throat> I love this hammer. <laughs> I can tell you, I did that a few weeks ago and I smashed my thumb. Uh, more importantly, there was my boss standing behind me and I'm trying to drive this nail stretched out like I'm in the pig somewhere and I'm hitting it like this and I get that thing centered square right on that thumb. And it was a framer's hammer, so it's got all those little v dabs and little things so it don't slip off the nail. And it slipped. <laughs> It slipped off and it hit my thumb. And the first thought that I had was not love. I was saying that right now. Amen. It wasn't love, if I'm being honest with you. Okay? So that's an area that we all get to work in, correct? God is good. <laughs> all the time, God is good, okay? And the only way that we can know God is to love God. And how do we love God? There's several ways that we can love God. There's several ways that we can. We can turn our hearts and our life over to Him. But one of the easiest ways that we can fill our hearts up with love is to read His Word. Right? You get what I'm saying? Like, if I went to a, a gas station and I pulled my truck up to the gas pump and I sat it there 
and I sat at the gas pump, and I didn't get out of my truck, and I didn't grab the hose and put it in my gas tank and start filling it up, I would not get any fuel, correct? Okay, so if we're in our living room, and we have our Bible set on the coffee table, we have our Bible on our nightstand, we go by love, we go by the Word of God, we go by the grace of mercy, but we keep getting it. We keep moving. i got to get something out of my drawer before I forget it. i got to get a pan out of the cabinet so I can put some biscuits in it. Amen? i got to get some fuel in my mower so I can get my grass mowed. But we walk right past the key to life. I do it all the time. Do, do you feel convicted of it? I feel convicted more and more about standing God's word. Because this is the answer to love. This is the answer to what we need in today's society more now than ever before. I know every generation has said that. I remember as a child, and Miss Nellie was preaching at the old Pentecostal church in Reedsville, North Carolina. And she said, I know tomorrow he's coming back. There's no way. I mean, this is like 73, okay? And here we are in 2023. And the world is just as wretched then as it is now. It hasn't got any worse. It's just filled with more people. That's the reason why there's more sin. There's more people to sin. Amen? The devil has been working since the day he come down from heaven. Amen? Y'all believe that? Yes. As a church, if we worked as hard as Satan did, what would this, what would this community look like? I'm just being honest, man. I, I, I'm guilty, too. When I was... Preparing this sermon, Tracy will tell you, I, I need this more probably than everybody that's sitting here. Because, I mean, I, I just, I need to know what love is. I need to know and care about what love is. I need that first reaction out of my mouth to be love. Not only for my salvation, but, but for my witness. For my witness. How can I stand up and say, I love everybody, I love this, I love that, and I don't act that way? I have no, I have no fruits of love hanging off my limbs. I'm not big enough to have a lot of things hang off of them. But love ain't always hanging off of them, amen? Love ain't always the first thing that comes out of my mouth. I'm ashamed to say, but if I lie... And I'd be, you know, I shouldn't be up here standing and tell you that we, that we all struggle with that, correct? Or maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. It's possible. I don't think so. Does love condemn? Love does a lot of things. We know love takes sacrifice. Does love condemn? Let's go to John 3, 17, if you will, in your Bibles. Let's read what John says about love. No one thinks about no one thinks about the bad parts of love or what what people call love. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. I'm trying to tell you what God's word is. But sometimes as Christians, we need to watch how we say things. Amen. Because my Bible says this in John 3:17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him and might be saved. The world through him might be saved. So now when we're witnessing to our brothers and sisters in Christ, or we're witnessing trying to plant a seed so the Holy Spirit can water it, and salvation can blossom through that cold, dark heart that we have as sinners, we don't condemn our brothers and sisters. We listen. Amen? With a joyful heart, we listen. We, we, we're, we're not sitting in some lofty estate looking down on everyone that sins because we go to church every Sunday morning or Wednesday when the church doors are open. We're not high and mighty. If we want to be a reflection of God's grace and God's mercy, and we open ourselves up to people, what do we do as Christians to help one another in Christ? What do we do as Christians to develop a godly lifestyle in their lives as well as our lives? This all has to do with love. 
So as we're, as parents, you know, sometimes we have to do the hard thing, which is a boundary. And the Bible was a foreshadow of what parental boundaries are. We were given <coughs> on, the mount, on the mountain, Moses was given things called Ten Commandments. Amen. Because without the right and the wrong, we go astray. Right on? We just go astray. We're just like that. <coughs> we can't help it. We're sinful people. You know, if we don't have boundaries. Parents have got to have boundaries with their children. Amen? There has to be right and there has to be wrong. There has to be consequences thereof. Okay? We have a consequence if we don't love Christ, if we don't accept Christ in our heart. What is our consequence? It's everlasting life in hell. That's what our consequence is if we don't turn our hearts. Now, what happens if our children start doing the wrong thing and we just look away? Oh, it'll be okay. They have time to turn their hearts around. They got time to turn their lives around. I want to be their friend. You know, I work at, uh, I work at Hope Tree, um, and I get to see children. I work there on the equine base. I, I, I'm, I'm an um, EGALA certified equine specialist um, that's nationally, internationally recognized, okay? And I use horses in therapy along with psychologists and psychiatrists, and we work with some of the worst of the worst, okay? And I've seen things, and I've heard things that are shocking to me as a father to daughters and to sons and to be a grandfather. I've heard stories of parents who <coughs> tried to be friends and it led astray and it had no boundaries and the children were running wild as bucks. And now they're just in iniquity and they don't know right from wrong. And they're just trying to make sense of themselves. I have a man today that stood right at the foot of the cross can you imagine Christ standing at where the hole where they was going to bring him up in? And as bad and as mad as we get about those things, those parents who don't love their children, those people who, who despitefully use those children, as bad as we hate them, Christ <coughs> died on the cross for those very people. It's hard to understand. It's, it's hard to grip. Because when I hear those stories, Self hears those stories. I get swole up. And I would love to have 10 minutes in a round pen with one of them parents. 10 minutes. That's not the way God did. God laid down on that cross. He's laid down on that cross. And they spread his hands out. And they drove them nails deep into him. They did they fashioned the same way with his feet, and they beat them nails. In him, he didn't use his fist to beat those who were trying to put him on that cross. He went to that cross because of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because my God, my Father, he perished on that day on the hill of Golgotha. So we wouldn't have to. That's unconditional. And if my God can do it, we can do it. Amen. 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 He set the example. I remember when I was younger, I was not really book smart as I am right now. It hasn't changed at all, right? I'm not very book smart. But I try to be like, uh, I, I try to immerse myself in different cultures, and I try to immerse myself in like, uh, <clears throat> like different professions. So... You know, I can get an understanding of what they're supposed to do because if I can get what they're doing, then I can I can probably understand it a little bit better. You know, and um, to me, uh, <laughs> I always had to be shown something. Like my daddy, I know he struggled with me. My dad was a very intelligent man. He, you know, graduated high school early. He went to Penn State. He got his master's. He was an instructor at West Point. You know, like. He was a very learned man, and here I was. <laughs> Couldn't remember nothing. <laughs> I mean, I had to memorize everything that man ever said, you know. And in my failures, in my failures, I saw patience. Amen. 
in my failures I saw patience through my father's eyes. Now, I know it was a struggle for a learned man to have such a son, but uh, every one of us are a blessing. We just got to figure out how it is. Amen. Every one of us is made here for a purpose, and we got to find out what it is. It's not my job to tell you what it is. It's your job to put your boots on, tighten your straps, and start moving forward. And then you, to whatever thing you're going to move forward to, right? But I'm thankful that in all my mistakes, in all my struggles in life, I'm not condemned. I'm not condemned. I, I am lifted up. I am raised above. I am not in the miry muck that I was because I've been lifted up. To condemn, to be oppressed, to be pushed down is to stay where you're at. My Bible said God lifts us up and puts us on a high place. Amen. Takes us out of where we are. So love does not condemn. Remember that. Okay? That's important. As Christians, as we're out testifying and we're talking about God's grace, don't sit there and tell somebody how bad they are, but, oh, God, it's so good. He's going to help you. You're a mess right now. I hate when people come up, ah, oh, you need some help, don't you? <laughs> they, you really need some help. You're destroying this right now. You don't have to do it that way. You can say, hey, man, you need a hand? Yeah. No, I, I didn't look like you needed a hand. I was just here to help you. Man. And then... You can turn around, take a breath real quick, gather yourself, and go back to the conversation. Because obviously he needs help. Amen? So as Christians, let, let's try to approach when we're... How many of us witness for one thing? God's grace. Everybody witnesses God's grace. Don't be scared. Okay, can everyone raise their hand? Let's try that first. Can everybody raise their hand? Okay, all right. That's a start. Okay, now, when you witness to people, you don't have to go out and smack them in the head with the Bible and say, hey, man, this is the way it is. We do witnessing the most simple way by showing our fruits of the Spirit. Amen? And I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. We're going to talk about fruits of the Spirit. But we do our greatest witness by the actions that we take as Christians. Um, I love to sit at a mall or I love to sit in a park and not look at the beautiful surroundings, but watch the people. This is one of my very favorite things to do. I remember when I was in the military, I used to set up on OPs as an observation post, and we would be way up on top of a mountain somewhere, or we'd be hiding in a building. And I'm sitting there, and I'm writing down all this intel, and we're sending it back to Division Main. And I guess maybe that's what started me to love the, just watching people and seeing what they did. But, you know, you can watch a godly person in the interactions with their children. You can, you can see godly teenagers when they're rambunctious and they're talking and they're laughing and they're carrying on. You can hear, you can hear the fruits of the Spirit or you can hear not the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Amen? In our language, in our face. I was always told that church was an amazing place to go to and what a blessing it was. And the first time that I heard the name Jesus Christ, I was just a kid. And it was vacation Bible school. And I went there and, you know, the preachers was talking about how happy it was and how much, how much joy would fill your heart if you had Jesus Christ in your heart. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was like, yeah. And I was like looking at the kids, other the adults, and they were like, <laughs> <laughs> I've got peace in my heart. <laughs> but, you know, the minute you say, hey, uh, we're going to have a dinner after service, that's when they get Pentecostal. And they're ready to go. Amen. <laughs> they're, ready, they're ready to do it. Little... What's up, Cheryl? I'm like, <laughs> no, no. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, if, if we... If we're a people of God and we have love in our hearts, then what is there not to be happy about? Can we not just spread joy for, well, can we spread joy for like 45 minutes to an hour? Um, my first sergeant told me one time, false motivation is better than no motivation at all. Okay, so just for your partner's sake, smile every once in a while. Amen? There's four ways to make love override or control our lives. It's put love at the top of your to-do list. Put love at the top of your to-do list. And I list a couple of verses. John uh, 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. 
Um, we don't have time to go through that right now, but um, if you want to write that verse down. Four ways to make love override or control our lives. Put love on the top of your to-do list, 1 John 3, 4. Know why love is so important to a godly walk. And this is Matthew twenty two forty. 40. I, I'm going to read this one because this, <coughs> this one right here is a, this is a don't miss type situation here. 2240. 2240. And it says, On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. And the, the law started in 38 and 39. The first of the great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. That was the first of the great commandments. And the second is like, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. So you should love your God with what? With all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Okay, so let's think about it. Um, so we love Christ with our heart, but we know our hearts are deceitful and our hearts can't be trusted, correct? Now don't forget this. Don't, 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 don't think if I have Jesus in my heart, then I'm, I'm good to go. That's not the case. That you have to keep <coughs> Jesus in your heart. You have to keep his word in your mind so it can stay in your soul, Okay? The only way that we can keep Jesus in our heart is to keep reading his word, to surround ourselves with godly people, to immerse ourselves in worship, to immerse ourselves in prayer, to immerse ourselves in listening to people bring the word of God. That is the only way that we can accomplish these commandments. Amen? And if you don't have these things that I'm telling you, then the Ten Commandments that they gave Moses... And then all the other commandments that Christ gave us through his disciples and his teaching and his healing and his parables mean absolutely nothing. It means nothing. Take awareness of the nature of love. What is the nature of love? Let's go to Acts 17. Verses 29. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something that's shaped by art that man, uh, by man's devices. Truly, these times of ignorance of God overlooked by now commands of all men wherever you to repent because he has anointed, excuse me, he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who has ordained. He has given he has given assurance to do this all by the raising of him from the dead. Okay. So the awareness of Christ, we know that God works through people, right? I, I, I will say that like um, I love art, I, I love music. Um, I'm, Tracy will tell you sometimes uh, um, she can't believe some of the things I listen to. I like listening to opera. Uh, you know, I like going to uh, art museums and stuff like that. You know, um, now you probably wouldn't think that about me, but I really do. And I can see talent. I can see things in people's hands or hear it in their voices. But does that make them godly? Because I think it's beautiful. No, it doesn't. Um, I, I like music. The music I grew up with was Eagles and, you know, Led Zeppelin and Boston and Kansas. And I still listen to Eagles, Led Zeppelin, Boston, Kansas. Um, and I love it. And it motivates me. You know what I'm saying? That motivates me. Uh, Kansas, you know, more than a feeling. Uh, that's Kansas or is that Boston? Oh, that's Boston. <laughs> Justin Wynn, that's Kansas. There you go. Okay, so get back to my point, guys. What I'm saying is you can love other things in this world and then not be God, right? You can't. You can do that.
But the only thing that gives us true love, the only thing that will last in our life and in our hearts and for eternity is the love of Jesus Christ. Okay? So if you look at the screen, Jen said, hey, uh, hey boss, I put some horses up on the screen. And I'm sure everyone knows that they're Clyde Fails. Um, very nice little horses. Um, but I love horses. Just like, I, you know, I love biscuits and gravy. I've said that a hundred times. <laughs> uh, like I love ice cream. You know? Um, I told my buddies when I was in Korea, I said, look, man, I love y'all to death. And I'm going to miss you so bad when I'm gone, but I'm not going to miss the plane that gets me back to the United States. Amen? <laughs> and that's the way I look. I look at things of earth as a fleeting love and a fleeting life. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And that's what the scriptures were saying right here. Silver and gold could be melted down. Amen? It can be thrown into the furnace and broke apart. Pictures and, and songs could... You know, we can forget the lyrics of songs. We can forget the licks of the guitar, right, Vic? We don't always remember, Steve. We don't always remember the right licks there. But, so we can forget that. That's a fallible thing. But Christ's eternal love is not, it's infallible. It can't be broken. It can't break. It can't be put on pause. It can't be put on hold. It lives with us and breathes with us as long as we stay in God's Word. This was a hard sermon for me to do. Um, and, and I'll tell you, number, my point number four is, is why I'm saying this, is demonstrating the action of love. What are the actions of love? I'll tell you three things that is actions of love right here. Is that love values the person. And now when I say person, I ain't talking about you. Like yourself. The other person that you're with. Okay? Love is vulnerable to that other person. That's the part that got me. That's the part that got me right there. Because I can't be wrong. How many of y'all are always right? I'll be the only one. Okay. Right. But when we're vulnerable, there's... That's, that's not being right always, right? We, we have to be willing. Uh, you can be right, and you can have a happy wife. You know what I heard that saying? Uh, My dad told me that. And I didn't understand what he said. Yeah, I know. I'm proficient. No. <laughs> But I, I will always, I will tell you now that I'm not always vulnerable to the other person. I'm not, I don't always let that other person in. I keep that person at a distance a lot of the times. For whatever reason it may be, I keep people at a distance. Call it protection, call it what you want. Uh, I don't know what you call it, but am I allowing love and, and peace to flow through me if I'm holding this stuff back? You know, if I'm scared to be vulnerable, if I'm scared to let people know how, how, my, how I really feel about them, I, 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 I used to be the person who would think that uh, if I had to, to say emotional things, like caring things, um, things that I really felt in my heart, but as a man I couldn't say them because I was too tough to say it. Say, man, I love you so much. I love the way the wind blows your hair. I love it when I stand beside of you and I smell your perfume. When the wind gently blows your hair. Or to watch your children play on the playground and listen to those voices shrill. You see the joy in their heart. And be valuable enough to say, that's, that's one of the greatest things I ever said. You grab them babies up and squeeze them and hug them and tell them how much you love them. I got to tell you that I've not always been that grandpa. I've not always been that father. You know. But at some point you have to make a promise to yourself that you're not going to be who you used to be. If God is in us and God has changed the world, then we have to change with his grace. We can't always be the tough guy. 
We can't always, just because of that's the way I was brought up. I hate when people say, I hate when people say, listen, I've been through a lot of trauma, and I just can't do that. I can't do it. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. Some of you may not know about me. I, I, I'm, I was uh, discharged from the military, and uh, I had intermittent explosive disorder, and I had uh, post-traumatic, and I have post-traumatic stress disorder, and I have uh, angry outbursts sometimes. And the doctors told me that I would never get along with people. The doctors told me that I would never be able to stand up in a group of people and have somebody say something negative to me without me um, being who I used to. The fact is, when the love of Christ comes into your heart, it changes you. It changes your thought process. It changes the actions that you take. Now, I'm going to tell you that I, stu I suffer with post-traumatic stress every day of my life. Some days it's worse than other days. But what I don't suffer with is who to go to when I'm struggling the most. <coughs> Who do I bend a knee to? And tell all that I have to him. Tracy will tell you that I struggle with the wind. I do. I struggle with the wind. I was a demolition specialist, so we used demolition a lot. And every time that an explosion would go off, there would be such a concussive wind that it would shake the building and it would suck us in and blow us out at times. So I struggle with that sometimes. I used to, I used to go and avoid, do avoidance was a great coping skill of mine. I would go into a room by myself and I closed myself in a dark place. And I would do everything I could do to get rid of that noise in my head or that feeling that I felt back in combat or whatever. And uh, I had to turn that over to Christ because for a long time I, was, I had so much anger and so much hate and so much meanness in me. You know, couldn't understand what it was. But I'm telling you that God is bigger than every one of those problems. That God is there when no one else can be there. When you feel like there's no one else you can talk to about what you're going through. My God is there. When you're at the lowest, and I don't know how he did it, Paul and Silas, when they were at their lowest and they were thrown in jail, they rocked the worship hymn so loud that the cell doors busted open. And I want to be like Paul like that. I want to have victory through an all-out assault on who I am. I want to have victory not in me but in and the way we have victory in Christ is to love through the battles. I need to learn how to love and react in love instead of reacting in anger and using a diagnosis as an excuse. Christ had the greatest excuse of all. I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm not laying on a wooden cross and letting you crucify me. I can call down legions of angels to wipe this whole earth out. But I'm not going to because that's not what I was called to do. We're all called to do something in this world. Christ was called to die on the cross for us. What are you called to do? I can't answer that for you. I don't know what I've been called to do. I really don't. I love to worship music. I love to sing worship. I love to, to, to read God's word and, and, and deliver things that I feel like has been on my heart to talk about. But I don't know what I'm supposed to do in this world, so I just do everything I can. And if you're like me, then do everything you can. Because <coughs> when, when I got saved, I wasn't on the altar and somebody put a plate down and with a name tag and said, this is what you are. You know, I go to an office building and I'll say project manager or I'll see accountant or something like that. I, I never got that when I got saved. My, my pastor told me that I was a disciple of men and that I needed to get out and work. 
and I needed to be a loving husband. I'm a whole lot of things. I, maybe that's what it is. Maybe maybe Christians are, have so many different things they have to be. It won't fit on one name tag. Amen? We have to wear many hats. Amen? How do we wear our hats? No, most, most, most importantly, that love, it, love has a cost. And I, and I said what that cost was. The cost was uh, Christ dying on the cross for us. That's what our cost was for love. That I don't want you to forget that God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his son and God the son. But let's go back to God so loved the world. Any builder in here that's ever created something like, and been really proud of it? Like, I'll tell you something. Uh, I, I bought a mantle and I, I didn't have the knowledge to put the stain and all that stuff on it. So my brother, Joe, I asked him, could he hook me up? He said, yeah, he hooked me up. So he came over to the house and he put this mantle <coughs> on the fireplace. And uh, I had a hand in just putting the screws on the wall. You know, he had a hand of putting that stain on there and working it just right, making it look beautiful. <coughs> and he hung it up, and he just sat back. And I'm looking at it, and I was just like, okay, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. My wife has been begging me for this for so long, so now she's not on my back anymore. And it's nice to look at. How many of you ever think that when God's up in heaven and Father, forgive me for trying to put my me be in place of you, but can you imagine him looking down on earth? Because he created every one of us. He created every one of us. And as teachers, when you have pupils that go out in this world and they become great and prosperous, you had a hand in that. You had a hand in that. Those teachers that are here among us, you had a hand in that. Those mothers, those fathers that were compassionate, you have a hand in that. But I wonder what it's like to look down and you've created, if you don't know what beauty is, look on the mountain. Go to a mountaintop and look off a mountain. Go to Montana and look at the big skies in Montana. You can go closer. Just open your eyes and turn over and look at your wife. Don't look in the mirror, but look at your wife. <laughs> God's handiwork, we can see it everywhere. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm thankful for him. And Father Lord, I, I hope and pray that we do justice to you as we walk through this world. Is that not a prayer to have? Is that, Father Lord, it's, uh, it's not my will, but your will? And that... Uh, I know what I would like to have happen, Father, but what, what would you like me to do today? I was at a prayer conference, and that guy told me, he says, uh, he, he said, hey, I, I want to start my, my, my life with prayer every morning. And he said, sometimes I'm lazy, so I just throw my arms up where I'm sitting. And I just start praying right there. He's sitting in the bed, and he's looking to heaven. Uh, and people say, why do you look up when you pray? Well, you know, if Christ is at the right hand of the Father and he ascended into heaven, <laughs> where am I supposed to look? You know what I mean? So don't ever feel bad about praying and putting your eyes up, sliding and looking and opening your eyes up and letting the Lord know how awesome he is, how great you are, Father. Galatians 5.22, it gives us, it gives us some ways that... Uh, we're supposed to have some things hanging off our arms and our legs and our noses and the top of our heads as we walk through this world to identify us as a spiritual person, to identify us as, hey, that's one of those in the way, that's one of those Christian people. You want to call me a holy roller? Who so? I'll roll right on past you, right through the heaven's gates. I care less. Amen? But the fruits of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no laws. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions of desires. 
If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us do not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. That's our homework for this week. If, if you need to throw a little fertilizer on it, do so. We've been throwing it out for about 45 minutes now. Nothing but fertilizer. Want some love? I shed a couple of tears. There's just some water. All right. I needed to get filled up today. And I, when I prayed for this sermon, it did not look like this when I first started. And God knows our hearts. And he knows when we need to be refreshed. And he knows when we need to be filled up. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to falter and just miss the mark. It's not okay to operate in this world without love. It's not okay to operate in this in your relationships, in your family, in your friendship, work zones. It's not okay to operate without love. And as the guys come up, and uh, we're going to sing. Christ dedicated his whole life on the earth to others, never taken for himself or saving for the future. The time is now to spread the gospel. So my question is, why are we holding on to what the answer is? Why are we holding on to that gift of freedom, that gift of, that surpasses all understanding, that gift that, it, that God has freely given us? Why are we hard, hiding in our hearts when it's freely given to us? Let's start giving some back. I just read the fruits of the Spirit, 22, uh, Galatians 5, 22. If you ever have a question on where they are, it's always Galatians 5, 22, okay? Let's try to make an effort to show God's grace and mercy through our actions with our family, our friends, and our community. Let's pray. Father Lord, I thank you for the strength to stand among my friends, among my church family, and give them what you have given me in my heart. Father, forgive me for the times that I faltered and when I went off track. Father, make me a better, make me a better Christian, make me a better husband, make me a better dad. Make me a better worshiper. Make me a better follower of your word. Not by the words I say or the songs that I sing, Father Lord, but the actions that I take. <clears throat> Father, in your words say we are known by the fruits that we bear. Father, I pray that you just abundantly bless this church with, with the fruits of the Spirit, Lord, with kindness and meekness and long suffering. Father, I pray that in our witness that we have, that we bring people forward, not turn them away, not by our actions, not by the sounds that we that we make the anger that we have at times, Father Lord, but the lovingness and the openness that you share freely with us. Father, let us always remember the sacrifice that comes with love, the obedience of Christ. Things are not always easy to do, to follow the laws of your word. Lord, it's not always the easy thing to do, but it's always the right thing to do. And Father, if we're on the right hand and we're on the right side, Father, you'll be right beside us promised in your word that you wouldn't give us a task that we couldn't do, that we couldn't accomplish. And the key to that is without you, Father, we're not in our own selves, but in you. We will boast. We will puff ourselves up without that. Father, Lord, always remind us of who we are and what we are. And while we were placed on this planet, Father, Lord, what is our job on this planet but to spread the gospel of your word not our words, not the words of men, not the words of poets, the lyricists, Lord. Nothing we have to say would ever be good enough to enter the gates of heaven, Father Lord, but that is that's inspired by your holy word and your holy love, Father, that agape love that flows freely from heaven's gates to our hearts. I love you and I praise you and I magnify your name. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I want to I want to talk to you for a minute. And maybe we can make a maybe we can make a plan together. Maybe we can say that listen, from, from right now, 
I'm going to try to love a little bit better than I did yesterday. I'm going to be a little bit better of a Christian today than I was yesterday. I failed yesterday, Father Lord, but today I, I got a new start. I'm going, to, I'm going to work harder. Raise your hand if you, just slip it up in there. Raise your hand if you, if you have that prayer. If you, if you want to, thank you for those hands. But if you want to, if you want to work on that, be a better, be a better person with love. And maybe, maybe you have you struggle with, with anger. Maybe you struggle with impatience. Oh, we raise our hands for that too. We can say, Lord, I, I fall short of your grace in that. And I want you to help me. I want my brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with me. I want us to be. I want us to be a team together, Lord, because in your word, we're so more to gather in your name, Lord, that we can accomplish the faith of a mustard seed can smash the mountains, Father. You promised us that in your word. We're going to sing a song, We Bow Down, and if you want to come up and pray at the altar, we'll have people up here to pray with you. If you want to pray right where you are right now, you have an opportunity to worship the way you want to worship right now. It's the last thing that we're going to do before we dismiss. Don't leave anything here. Don't go home with I should have, I wished I had. Maybe if I don't walk out this door and do that. You can stay seated or you can stand. We're going to worship. And if you want to come up and pray, you're more than welcome to come up and pray.